Okay, so welcome to another session of our repertory tutorial where we are reviewing our foundational material about the repertory. And right now we're going through the structure and making sure that we know what is in what sections. And part of the reason why we really want to focus on this and do this is because we want to be flexible. There are so many times when the things that we can look up in the repertory can. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I, I wear white, and so scarves are some color. Actually, people often give me scarves when I go teach and travel, and um, so it's a way of honoring these people who have been kind to me. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, we're going through the sections in great depth as a way of reminding ourselves and learning what's in what spot and what do we want to look at in that spot and why do we want to be able to find it in here and there and other places. So we have to know pretty well what's in abdomen that we're not going to find in urinary organs, what's in chest that we're not gonna find in skin. In order to be efficient in the way that we work, we wanna be very careful about all this stuff. Okay, are there any questions from last time? No, you guys ready to jump right in? Okay. I love seeing everybody sign on. All right, Dr. Kent's advice. Um, I gave you guys the link where you can download the whole thing so you can have it on your computer or you've got book in the hand. I have to admit that I have been separated from my repertory since January. I haven't exactly gone through withdrawal because I have my computer repertory, but my copy of Kent, repertory and my copy of the physical book of the organon and chronic diseases that's like my left arm and my right arm and my left leg they are all at my apartment in las vegas and after the conference i will be driving to go get them so i'm looking forward to that very much all right so dr kent's advice the plan of the repertory is uniform throughout. Remember that Kent created a structure that didn't exist before him. It was quite random. And so he took everybody else's content and he built this new structure. He says, it's one which admits on the indefinite expansion of each division. So remedies can be added from time to time as they come into use or have been confirmed and verified. He's trying to create things that other people can expand, which is exactly what has happened into the later repertories. It has been attempted to proceed in every case from generals to particulars. And this was actually one of Dr. Kent's big pieces of advice in general about using the repertory, was that we should use general rubrics as our major guidelines and from there go into particulars to identify strange, rare, and peculiars or commonalities because he says, um, it has been attempted to proceed in every case from generals to particulars and in carrying this out, the aim has been to give first of all a general rubric containing all the remedies which have produced the symptom followed by the particulars, the time of occurrence, the circumstance, and lastly, the extensions. And here it may be remarked in regard to extensions that the point from which a certain symptom extends is the one under which that symptom will be found, never the point to which it extends. So for example, if you have something where pain goes from the belly button into the groin, you can never find that symptom by looking up something that tells you about the groin. Or if it goes from the belly button into the heart, you will not find that symptom in the heart section. You have to look at the place that the pain originates in order to find where it extends to. Okay, 
Any questions about that? Hello, Marie, welcome, glad to see you here. All right, so from generals onward to particulars. And you guys can find this little paragraph that I've got here in Kent's advice that mostly nobody reads at the beginning of the repertory because it's so interesting to go look at symptoms. Why would you wanna to listen to what Dr. Kent has to say? I certainly didn't read it for a long time, but there's good advice in there. So we're doing it in little bite-sized chunks, sips, paragraphs. Okay, so last time we did all of the, the stool and rectum symptoms, and we talked about how awkward it can be to discuss social pariah things, things that you would never discuss with your mother. Ooh, or your grandmother, ooh. You don't want to know those, so your Uncle Charlie, no, you do not want to have those conversations with people that you know and love. However, we need to be prepared to have those conversations with our clients because they're going to need our help in those areas. And so we have to go through a process of normalization, a desensitization to the E factor of talking about the fact that the stool is bloody or that it appears in an explosion in the toilet bowl or that it's full of mucus or everything else that we never wanted to know. So part of the importance of reading the repertory again and again and again, especially in these sort of delicate, not easy to discuss topics, is that it desensitizes us. It helps to normalize for us, and it also gives us wording and language. So it's more important to spend time reading these than it is, say, extremities. Not that that's not important, but people are not hesitant to say something about their extremities. So you've got pain in your left elbow. What's embarrassing about that? Not a problem which is why you need to really invest the time to read the rectum and stool sections again and again and again so that it doesn't freak you out to talk about that stuff with someone. Because if it freaks you out, it's going to freak them out. And if you're okay with it, they'll be okay with it. So one of the classes that I just announced was that I'm going to be doing an irritable bowel and lookalikes class in September, you guys will have gotten this in your email. So um, we'll be talking about irritable bowel syndrome and diverticulitis and diverticulosis and Crohn's and inflammatory bowel and all that stuff. And we're gonna be showing where in the repertory can we be finding these things because homeopaths who went before us were dealing with all that long before anybody had any of those diagnostic terms. And you've got to be comfortable with all that stuff. Okay, so almost to the same extent, this also applies with urination. For the most part, people find it easier to talk about urination than about stool symptoms, but not always. People can be very typical. Oh, thank you. Marie says, I just took a case last week using the Bristol chart and it worked so well. Have you guys, are you guys familiar with the Bristol chart? Let me see if I can pull that up. It's great to have aids like this. Okay, so here's the Bristol stool chart, and you can show it to your clients. So there's separate hard lumps that are hard to pass. There's a sausage-shaped something that's lumpy. There's a sausage-shaped something that's not 
lumpy and it has cracks on the surface. There's something that is smooth and soft, soft blobs with clear cut edges, fluffy pieces with ragged edges, mushy and then watery. Okay, so people can tell you, oh, it's like this, it's like that, you know? And so what Marie was saying was that she used this chart and that helped you? Your client was able to, yeah? Oh, good. Oh. Yeah, she says it helped and another yay. Yes. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've had requests to do this irritable bowel class for a long time and it just wasn't really on my schedule, but now it is. Yeah. Okay. So, we're going to talk about urinary organs. Urinary organs is kind of unique in the repertory. It's the only section in the repertory that is built like this. There is the section of urinary organs like there's generalities or extremities or chest or skin. But within it, instead of, you know, if, if, you look in the extremities section or in the let's use something that we've already been through and we haven't gotten to extremities yet so let's use something we've already been through in the head section we see kent using information of location there's the forehead there's the vertex there's the occiput there's the temples and so he gives this information about locations of the head. Now, in urinary organs, it's kind of the same where he's breaking it out into locations, but each of these locations kind of is its own section. It's not like you go to head pain and then you find head pain in the forehead, head pain in the vertex, head pain in the occiput, head pain in the temples. No, he didn't do it that way. He took each different organ because they're kind of independent things and he put them in the lump of urinary organs and sort of concatenated them all together, bladder, kidneys, prostate, urethra, and urine. So I'm not sure how he chose the order there, but um, this is the way that we're going to be looking at this. So. This is one section that has all of these subsections, all of which are related to urination. And the bladder section has information about the bladder itself, as well as lots of rubrics about initiating and controlling urination. So, but what if what if you so Marie, you just took a case of a little two year old boy. Let's say that one of you guys has taken a case of a little five year old fella who is still wetting the bed every night, maybe twice in a night, where he'll just completely empty the mom changes the sheets two hours later, same thing. Find a rubric for urination in bed at night while asleep. Where would that take you? Welcome, Ellen. Glad to see you here. So we're doing urinary organs today. So we're looking for a rubric for urination in bed at night.
Yeah, about the the reminder links. You know, right now it's set up so that when you RSVP, when you set up an RSVP, it gives you a confirmation and it asks you, do you want to put this on your calendar? So it gives you the little Google Calendar thing or iCal or whatever it is. And um, I'm my next step is to get it set up so that like four hours or the night before the actual thing you've RSVP'd for, it will automatically send you a reminder email with the link. But I haven't, we haven't quite got there yet. Okay, urination involuntary at night. Yes, absolutely. And so what we're looking, and this is under which section? We've got to be ever so careful. You know, the reason why we have, we haven't really talked about this yet, but the reason why we have to be so, 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 so careful about the way that we write out a rubric, we have to include the section name and then the, the symptom and then the details of the symptom. Because there can be symptoms in kidneys, symptoms in urethra, symptoms in generalities where we might not know which one it is. So when you're putting them in here, be sure and put the section name in there. And in this case, it's actually a subsection. Although I truly, I've never seen anyone write out urinary organs, bladder, urination, involuntary night. People sort of forget that first part that just goes off into the Thule's. So you've got bladder, urination, involuntary night. Good, yes. Okay, so. Let's flip forward. You know, if you're, if you're working on your software, you can just click forward. But I really encourage you during these sessions to have book in the hand, which I certainly will after I get my repertory back from my place in Las Vegas. Okay, so um, let's flip forward through urinary organs. And bladder is actually the biggest section. Uh, within this group. So if you look in the kidney section, which is the next one, um, it's very brief. It's only a few pages. Now, this is actually a fantastic section to practice your understanding of the structure of the repertory. So keep that in mind because we're gonna be using this for an exercise later to refresh our understanding of where everything is located in the repertory. Um, in general, the symptoms in here are not about urination, they are about pain. Um, almost all of it is some kind of disruption that's happening in the kidney, like you can find abscess, or about pain. Now, there are some helpful entries for other things. So I spoke, you know, I do a lot of work with helping women get pregnant, helping them stay pregnant. And um, some of those gals have had earlier pregnancies with toxemia um, where they had a very, very early labor, very extreme circumstances, emergency C-section, and you know, had they lived in a different part of the world at a different time, they wouldn't have made it through that event. So um, toxemia of pregnancy, we're actually not going to find that in the sections about pregnancy. Pregnancy is a condition that is scattered all through the repertory. And so if we're looking in the kidney section, because kidneys is where toxemia originates, we need to find a rubric in there that can help us. So how about a rubric like kidneys inflammation? Is that close enough, do you think? What would you use for toxemia of pregnancy? Something like protein in the urine, maybe? Can you find something for that?
Kidneys, inflammation, toxemic. Exactly, good. So when, if you think, okay, I would look under um, female genitalia and try to find something about complaints of pregnancy, if that's where your mind went of where you would look for this, then you need to go make a cheat note there, wherever you first would think of it, so that it will be very easy to find this, because probably you're not actually going to be thinking that clearly if you've got a client who's in that urgent a circumstance. So, um, you know, these are, are remedies that uh, very often are going to be what the old homeopaths associated with uh, a goiter. You'll see words like strumous terrain. Do you know this term, strumous terrain? Or people, the old homeopaths will say something like strumous diathesis. So strumous means goiter, basically. It means that they're a thyroid-disrupted person. We might think of them as a Hashimoto's-esque person, uh, somebody with an enlarged thyroid, somebody with thyroid nodules, somebody with some kind of thyroid pathology. These folks are um, predisposed, and there's bunches of indicators in the homeopathic remedy thyroidinum about toxemia of pregnancy. And all of the Kali remedies, remember that Kali's have a big affinity for the kidneys. They control the water balance in the body. Potassium does in a lot of ways. And the Kali's have an affinity to the lungs and the heart in the upper half of the body and the kidneys in the lower half of the body. So in toxemia of pregnancy, in these rubrics like kidneys, inflammation, toxemic, you should be able to find things there like apis like uh, crotalus, like the calis, like thyroidinum. Okay. All right, so this particular section is really small and it's really easy to flip past it. So just remember, you know, when you're going upstream from bladders, kidney is next. Otherwise, you can flip right by it because it's what, like three pages? It's really, really small. And it's easy to miss. So for those of you who have put tabs on your repertory, you know, this is a good one to tab individually. Okay, so the next section, once we go past kidney, is prostate. And it's really short and even easier to miss because it's less than two pages. And this really has to do with the form and the function of the prostate gland. So if you look in there, it, it, you know, most, a lot of homeopaths, unless they work with a lot of men, they've never even looked in this section. Have you guys needed to use this section at all? So I want you to find a rubric for a keynote of Chimaphila that you guys would all recognize. Do you know this remedy? Chimaphila, which has the sensation of sitting on a ball. And this is a, actually a therapeutic that I use for men in San Francisco who do a lot of bicycle riding. All those West Coast guys, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, where they ride 20, 30, 50 miles a day, 500 miles a week. They do the Seattle to Portland bike ride back and forth. Um, and they spend a lot of time with weight bearing on their prostate, on the saddle of their bicycle, in a way that nature did not intend. There you go, thank you, Ellen. Prostate ball sensation of sitting on A. So, you know, you can look in there and find the abbreviation CHIM in there. Do you, do you guys see Chimaphila in there? 
Yeah. Okay, so keep going. It's so short. The next section is urethra. And this covers the things that happen in the tubes between the kidney and, oh, excuse me, those are ureters, between the bladder and the opening. And so on guys, it's longer, on gals, it's shorter, but it also includes discharges other than urine. And so this is actually a really useful section for gals who have urinary tract infections and guys who have urinary tract infections, where the location and nature of the pain is really important. You know, people will say, oh, I'm feeling it in the neck of the bladder or on the left side of the urethra. It is amazing how specific discomforts can be. Okay, so look in there in the urethra section. And, you know, prostate applies only to guys, but urethra applies to both. And so you've got some rubrics in there that you might not want to use for a woman, like cordy. Do you guys know this word? This is a curvature for uh, the penis. So that's not going to be relevant for a lot of gals. But you can find it there in the urethra section because that's going to be relevant there. Okay. And then if we look in our um, chart that we had here, we've got urinary organs. Oh, actually, you know what? This should be called out. Within urinary organs, maybe over here in discharges on the right-hand side, I should put in parentheses urine because it's its own little thing. You know, and, and a lot of this, we have to remember, was done back at a time when good old Dr. Kent was uh, dealing with chamber pots. And we are not. So he could tell that there was red sediment in the urine with a lycopodium patient in a way that we are never going to see. So I wish that I could find this section to be more helpful than it is. So I, one thing that is incredibly useful is that there is an amazing description of colors of urine. So I want you to see if you can find a rubric in there for urine that is brown like cow dung in water. Are you able to find that one? Got it. Okay. So again, we want to desensitize ourselves from any polite reticence about discussing rectum, stool, urinary issues, prostate, kidney function, bladder, you know, things that, that we've been taught since we were little, don't say that, don't say it out loud, don't talk about that in front of your grandmother. You know, we've gotta be really cautious about that. And we'll pick up next time about genitalia female, genitalia. All right, so how many of you on your, your actual repertory book have tabs on the edges of the pages? I put tabs on mine. I had one earlier, a Coonsley's version of Kent's repertory that I didn't put tabs on. I took markers in different colors and I wrote on the outside edge of the pages of each section. Honestly, I didn't find it nearly as helpful as tabs. Yeah, mine came with the indentions with the little tabs. Is that what you've got, Kristen? But over time, the little tabs themselves fell off. So you might want to do your repertory a little favor and give it a, a, a bit of help and just get like a piece of clear no-show scotch tape and fold it over those tabs so that you cover the page on both sides. 
around those tabs because otherwise they will come off. I don't know, maybe you bought a much more expensive repertory than I did, but otherwise they, they fall off and then you're like, oh, I don't know what that section is. Okay, and if you do add tabs on there, make sure that they're narrow because if they're too big, you're gonna catch them on anything and it'll rip the page off. I also had that happen. All right, so I want to encourage you this week, print out the remedy name list in the front. You can take pictures of it with your phone, and then just stick it on your fridge or on your bathroom mirror. So while you're standing there brushing your teeth, you can just read over them. This will save you so much time later just to know the abbreviation and the remedy name. And then I'm curious about your stick figure. Did you guys do your stick figures last time? How did it come out? where you draw a little stick figure and then a little line, mind, back, chest, extremities, and you just draw the sections around it. Anybody can do that one this last week? Please think about making some time to doodle that. And then I wanna challenge you to commit to five minutes a day of reading the repertory. Five minutes seems very long sometimes, or very short sometimes. So um, if you've got, uh, say, the um, repertory sitting beside you and you're watching television, five minutes is how many commercial breaks? Two, three? So when the commercial break comes on, you just read in the repertory, any section you like. But especially, I want you to desensitize and normalize the experience of looking at what's happening with stool symptoms and urinary symptoms by reading, reading, reading those sections. Okay? Any questions or comments? All right, then I will look forward to talking with you next session. We'll have another section session next Monday. And then the week after that, we're going to skip um, because I will be traveling. Okay. Uh, Marie says, I'm finding that having the repertory open during an intake helps me ask the right questions. I love having my repertory there and I absolutely do refer to it sometimes when I am taking questions. Yeah, and it will help direct you. Okay, all right guys, have a fabulous day and I will look forward to talking with you again soon. Bye-bye.